I'm privileged to have had my great and good friend, uh, Professor William Ray here, lecturing in our new building. He's been the inaugural speaker and we've been able to capture this for everyone to, be, to enjoy for the future. Thank you, Bill. I'm Dr. Bill Ray from the Environmental Health Center in Dallas, Texas, USA. And I'm going to talk on uh, environmentally triggered small vessel vasculitis. S small vessel vasculitis has been well known, or small vessel dysfunction, has been well known to cardiac surgeons ever since the inception of it. Because once we decided that we could bypass the lungs and the heart uh, with uh, oxygenated blood, we might be able to get a patient to survive. However, what we soon found was that uh, small blood vessels, if they didn't exchange the oxygen uh, with the tissue, uh, the patient wouldn't survive. And so there were brain dead patients and heart dead patients until this was realized. Now this, uh, this uh, problem has been realized now in the chemically sensitive patient and the electrically sensitive patient and has uh, pushed the field uh, ahead quite a bit. I want to uh, illustrate by two cases. The first one would be a 40-year-old who was diagnosed with and treated with small vessel vasculitis. What is the small vessel vasculitis? Clinically, it's spontaneous bruising, little red spots size of a pencil called petechiae, acneiform lesions, and uh, swelling. And this uh, patient, uh, or these patients, can be uh, triggered by foods, they can be triggered by molds, they can be triggered by chemicals, and electromagnetics. Uh, examples uh, of the different toxic agents that trigger them are legion. However, uh, we do know that um, mycotoxins, the toxins put out by mold, are a big offender in some of these as well as herbicides, pesticides, formaldehyde, and so on. Now this first case, I'm going to give two cases, uh, is a very simple case. This case, a classic, was a 40-year-old white male who came in with spontaneous bruising. I'm sorry, this was a female, not a male. With uh, spontaneous bruising, um, edema, petechiae, and acne foreign lesions, and the biopsies this was done by somebody else, obviously, who did a brain biopsy and found that there was perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, which is classic for the small vessels. Now, triggering agents can be uh, found in this patient, and they were, by intradermal neutralization for aspergillus, uh, cladosporum, alternaria, uh, stachybotrys, pesticides, and natural gas and solvents. And the uh, patient had normal gamma globulin E uh, and normal gamma globulin G. However, T lymphocytes were low uh, measuring the uh, immune system. Now the treatment was massive avoidance in the home uh, of mold, make sure it was mold free, cultures were taken, intradermal neutralization uh, injections for the molds and the mycotoxins, and the patient was well within four months. Very simple case. Now, a more complex case, which is the ones we see today, uh, was uh, case two. And this was a 56-year-old white, white male with recurrent headaches, weakness, uh, fatigue, syncope, and multiple PVCs, as well as the spontaneous bruising and peripheral edema, went around electrical equipments and computers. And uh, this uh, patient had a workup and was found with intradermal testing to be sensitive to these molds. 90% of the foods, 100% of the chemicals that were tested, an EMF challenge at 60 hertz, 900 hertz, and 1900 hertz. Uh, laboratory, again, the IgE and the IgG were normal, uh, but the, uh, for the T lymphocytes, the T3, T4, and T8 were decreased. So this patient had severe immune deficiency. The uh, avoidance 
tr the treatment, of course, was again, as we've shown in other talks, number one, massive avoidance of pollutants and molds in uh, chemicals and EMF. Number two, intradermal injections of molds, foods, and chemicals. Uh, number three, uh, and also multiple minerals, by the way. Uh, number three was neutralization of the EMF by Cyril Smith method. And four was nutrient supplementation of uh, A, C, E, and D in multi-minerals. And the other thing was removal of natural gas from the house. The patient was very sensitive to natural gas. And the wor re results were the patient was well, but it took a whole year to uh, get well. And she still was, uh, he still was fragile. Now the question is, how does this occur? Uh, we took a series of patients, 100 patients with small vessel vasculitis that were seen at the uh, Environmental Health Center. They were uh, ages 18 to 80 years of age, of 75 females and 25 males. Now the next slide will show you the microcirculation. And what's interesting about this is you can see the arterias uh, which carry the oxygen places where there's uh, the meta-arterial, the precapillary sphincters, and uh, the uh, preferential challenge. What's been shown now is that these vessels not only shrink uh, when they're uh, damaged by chemicals, but they also disappear. They also are not there in the tissue anymore. So they really shrink uh, by both anatomy and physiology. And of course, this is a quite interesting phenomenon that people didn't talk about in the past. Now, what happens when there's a total environmental load and a total patient overload is that you can have three things happen to these vessels. One is on the right here, where the autonomic nervous system gets fouled up and you get spasm of the microcirculation. The second one is where you leak the small vessels and you get the spontaneous bruises in the petechiae. And the third one are all kind of endocrine dysfunctions uh, that one sees here. And therefore you get a spasm and you get fluid leak and you get the various other supplements, particularly T lymphocytes that, lymph around, uh, that leak around the blood vessels and migrate out. New triggering agents uh, such as EMF uh, frequencies and various chemicals and other new mechanisms have been found and will be discussed. Now, some more data is that uh, the one new mechanism that's been shown now is that the uh, potassium will leak out of the vessel and the sodium and calcium goes in the vessel. There's a ratio of calcium outside the vessel of 59 parts per million and one within the cell per se. Now when these damage the cell membrane and shift into it, the, the potass or calcium uh, combines with the uh, uh, protein kinase, which is an enzyme, A and C, and then they're phosphorylated. Phosphorus hangs on to that. And what that does that increases sensitivity up to a thousand times. So therefore, suddenly, the blood vessel wall and the uh, uh, cell wall becomes damaged and becomes super sensitive. And that's the problem with chemical sensitivity and electrical sensitivity. And it makes it so much more difficult uh, to desensitize, as you can see, as time goes on. Now. With the, uh, this group of patients, uh, we had recurrent bruising and petechiae, recurrent edema, but we also had recurrent nasal stuffiness in 100% of the patients. And extremity vascular spasm, where you would look, have cold hands, cold feet, blue hands, blue feet, particularly the tips of the fingers. And actually, in some patients, we had gangrene of the extremities. Uh, due to that, we had one little child 
who was uh, about uh, five years old, who'd been playing in the neighbor's lawn, that had been herbicided, and she got actually gangrene of the foot. And we were able to reverse it all where she only lost the tips of the toes. Uh, but those, that's how bad it can be. And most of the chemically sensitive patients, and in this group of 100, every one of them had cold sensitivity. And so this is a, uh, a real problem uh, with uh, some areas of the world where uh, it's quite cold. And the other thing is, is that uh, air conditioning can trigger these people off. So cold sensitivity can be a real problem. Other associated symptoms, the next slide, 90% uh, had, had already had tonsillectomies. And 90% uh, had an increase in sense of smell, although there were a few who had just the opposite. They couldn't smell at all. The adult acne was quite interesting because here would be a 40-year-old 40, 40 la lady who would suddenly developed acne all over and of course, that would be devastating for her. Uh, recurrent sinusitis in 60 patients and recurrent headaches in 60. Migraines was a big thing in these people. And uh, next slide shows spastic colon and colitis because the GI tract is, is damaged and so is the autonomic nervous system going to the GI tract. Recurrent bronchitis, shortness of breath, wheezing, all the time occurred in about half the patients. And of course, recurrent overwhelming fatigue occurred in half the patients. The other half just had fatigue. <laughs> so I don't know how you differentiate the two, but some of them were so bad that they couldn't work. And some of them were so bad they laid in bed all the time. And that's what I would call the recurrent fatigue. 50% had recurrent sore throats. Their immune system was damaged to the point where they would have uh, recurrent sinusitis and recurrent uh, sore throats. And then uh, a lot of people had uh, um, arrhythmias, particularly atrial fib was a big one on these people. And of course, we don't really know the number because these group were living and this 100 was living patients. And we know that with recurrent ventricular arrhythmias, or recurrent ventricular afibrillation, they die on the spot. So you don't see those patients. And so I don't know how many of those would be involved had we had the accurate uh, numbers, but we know a lot of people do die. And uh, then a lot of them had depression and mental aberrations because they weren't getting enough oxygen to certain areas of the brain. So that was sort of a breakdown of the demographics of these patients. Now, if you look at the next slide, we had also severity of uh, incitants. And if you look at the right-hand column there, or your left-hand, I guess, uh, offending agents were beef and chicken and cigarette smoke and shrimp and uh, gas heat and ingested chemicals. But the, the ones that triggered the actual vasculitis in contrast to the vascular spasm were pork and inhaled chemical solvents. Wheat was a big one uh, for these people, and rice and inhaled chemicals, and these actually also triggered the uh, vasculitis in these patients. Corn was a big one, since corn is a big deal in America, and a lot of people were triggered by corn. And if we can go to the next slide, again, beef was there. I guess you could include milk in that also. Then. Uh, some of the other uh, type foods, plus inhalant chemicals, formaldehyde, phenol, pesticide, were all inhaled chemicals that caused problems. And if we can go to the next slide, I think we'll find out that many of the things happen. Now the question is, how do you uh, clean the di diet? How do you clean the food? And how do you get safe water? And these are all problems that the chemically sensitive patient needs to function properly, and particularly those with vasculitis. Now this happens to be a room that was shown uh, in the uh, history uh, where it was an extremely clean room, five times uh, less particulate and five times less chemical analysis. And this next slide will show you the same thing. 
And then how do you get clean food? What is organic food? Getting harder and harder to get organic food. For example, most seafood is contaminated now. Uh, it rains 200 tons of mercury a year from melting of the polar, polar ice caps. So you use, no matter how organic your food is, certainly the seafood is much more contaminated than the other. And they, they have these uh, places uh, where they raise fish, but it still rains there, and there are problems with it. Now, the other thing is uh, we did find, when we had analyzed the food for these patients, we found that they had uh, a, a little bit of uh, cadmium in it, and uh, I'm sorry, these slides seem to be turned around. There's less, less organic uh, than commercial, and they were aluminum, and a little bit of lead and mercury in them, obviously from the rain, whereas the uh, other commercial foods were quite toxic. Next slide shows the same thing. And arsenic, iodine, and here the organic foods are shown where the minerals are much more rich in the uh, organic food. Now in water, we like the uh, bottled spring waters because they have the earth's filters on that and uh, that uh, this seems to be a few around the world, the, the spa, the San Pellegrino, the Avion, the Mountain Valley uh, from Arkansas, and a few others in glass bottles. Now the other problem is they're putting and contaminating a lot of the water with uh, plastic bottles, and they have hexane and uh, two methylpentane, three methylpentane, so on in the water coming from leaching of the plastic. And uh, even our intravenous ones are that, and I've measured the glass intravenous bottles versus the plastic, and they have been loaded with uh, the hexane. And of course, the companies will tell you, well, it's not enough hexane or pentane to bother anybody, but is it? And what if you have to have IVs uh, all day for days and days and days? You're getting a lot of hexane and pentane from them. Of course, the vaccines need to be made uh, without preservatives in it, on the next side. And we do have preservative-free antigens, which can neutralize about 90% of the molds and foods and chemicals, although some of them can't, and some of them have to have EMF neutralization uh, that Cyril Smith and Jean Monroe migrated. Now, besides avoidance and treatment for the vascular wall uh, sensitization, we use oxygen therapy. And this is the uh, Von Ardine technique, old-fashioned oxygen bottles that are made out of cast iron that are very rather inert, ceramic masks, glass bottle reservoirs, outgas uh, silicone reservoir, as you can see here. This is not plastic. This is actually a cellophane and uh, made out of plant origin. Eight, next slide shows eight to four to eight liters a day for uh, two hours a day, constantly, it has to be constant, otherwise it won't work. And it has to be for 18 days in a row. And then it will uh, seem to clear up the majority of patients, although some of them have to have it often, more often. And the triggering agents can be myriad so that they may have to have it at home uh, occasionally just shows those things that I reiterated there. First you do a venous gas, anti-cubital anti fossa, no tourniquet, otherwise you get fault, false reading. And uh, it should read between 20 to 28 millimeters of mercury in contrast to the arteria, which measures 95 to 100 percent. Now, what are some of the uh, causes of the vasculitis per se, and of course it's usually lymphocytic triggered by some of the agents I've talked about, and what you get is endothelial swelling where the uh, cells in the endothelium swell, and uh, that impairs the uh, extraction phenomena uh, to the different organs on the next slide. And uh, that will uh, cause inflammation. 
And uh, if you give to the next slide, the reason for the cell phone bag, cellophane bag, is that it's a uh, uh, keeps oxygen levels at about 150 millimeters of mercury, so that uh, the, they could force the uh, uh, spasm open of the microvessels and also uh, plug the leaks and keep on with the uh, um, help cure the hypersensitivity. If we go on to the next slide, uh, we would uh, measure these things over uh, uh, six months to a year to make sure that the patient is going well. And a lot of patients will tell you that the minute they start getting good oxygen therapy, even sometimes uh, after five days or so, that their energy shoots up quite a bit, which of course makes sense because that's what uh, uh, produces the uh, ATP uh, in the mitochondria. And uh, it's been beneficial in, uh, next slide, in uh, people that have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, cardiovascular anomalies, GI upset, and visual uh, implants or any type of implant. For example, uh, there are now 220 types of synthetic implants, either metal or uh, uh, one of the different polys, polyurethane, polyvinyl, so on. And uh, one neutralizes for those and gives them oxygen therapy, and they can clear this up almost 100% uh, of the time. And of course, the neuropathies, which are the big bugaboo for all of medicine, really uh, get much better. Now, if you go to the next slide, where there were 67 patients, uh, you can see on the uh, far left the uh, mean uh, PVO2s before treatment and after treatment. And you can see that uh, uh, the majority, except for a few, uh, went down to normal. And those few had to be uh, gone for another 18 days uh, before they got uh, normal oxygen. And if you look at the last slide, next slide, you can see just uh, patients here who had uh, pre-treatment oxygen. They were at 43 millimeters of mercury, and they were 25 for they finished, 33, 24, and so on down the line, which shows you how nice that the oxygen therapy does work in these patients. So when done correctly, oxygen therapy is, so, is uh, helpful in a large number of patients. And isn't it amazing that we have to give uh, avoidance with rotary diets, and we've got to give uh, neutralization injections, and we have to give proper nutrition, and uh, keep the air clean, and give oxygen uh, for patients to get well, rather than a myriad of drugs. And so the other thing that was used in these patients was autogenous lympholytic factor which we developed at the Environmental Health Center. And you can see there were 88 of these patients, and improvement was in 88. And uh, I'm sorry, there were 100 patients, of course, and no improvement in uh, 12. And that was uh, P, uh, P of uh, 001, 0.001. So uh, the question is, are there any other entities that can be corrected with this small vessel vasculitis? And, uh, Recent, we, we found that uh, low gamma globulins are another thing that uh, uh, can be corrected now by gamma globulin administration. And uh, uh, as you look at this uh, slide, there's gamma globulin 1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, about 30% of uh, number 1 were decreased and so on down the line. Uh, and so these people had supplementation of gamma globulin also for a month or so. And that's all they needed. Now, uh, next slide shows the nutritional regimen that was used in these people. Five grams of vitamin C daily, glutathione 800 to 1,000 milligrams, uh, multi-minerals one capsule a day, multivitamins one capsule a day, and three capsules a day of ATP which does seem to boost their energy. Now, they, some of these did have intravenous, uh, seven and a half to 25 grams of vitamin C intravenously. Now, 
lot of people are sensitive to the vitamin C because most of it's made out of corn in America. Now, I don't know whether that's true here, too, but... Uh, 99% of the world's vitamin C is made by Roche. Pardon? 99% of the world's vitamin C is made by Roche, and they make it from corn. They make it from corn. So a lot of people are sensitive to uh, corn in the States, and so we have to neutralize them for it, or we change it to tapioca vitamin C. Uh, and orally, you can use potato or uh, beet-derived uh, also. Next slide shows you the multivitamins that we would uh, use on patients, and uh, these are all the other vitamins. The next slide is the multiminerals, and uh, we try to give those as uh, the problems uh, arrive, and we try to decrease the uh, uh, toxic uh, metals like manganese and barium and aluminum and lead and so on and usually use chromium, sulfur, silicone, and selenium. Next uh, slide shows some of the forms of the minerals, and I might note that the big problems are uh, if you're constipated, it's great, but if you're not constipated, it's not good, because mag oxide, which is magnesia, and mag sulfate, which is Epsom salts, can give you diarrhea, but it's great for the people who have uh, heart irregularities and have mineral deficiencies and their uh, GI tract doesn't work well. And of course, uh, zinc and uh, iron and so on down the line, selenium, chromium can be used. Amino acids uh, we use would be uh, tryptophan, lysine, leucine, and uh, about two grams a day. Uh, valine, threonine, and so on, and then the glutathione and arginine. Lipids, of course, uh, use most of the oils, salmon oil and uh, <clears throat> cod liver oil and flax oil, sunflower, safflower oil for these. And uh, finally, in conclusion, common triggering agents for vasculitis uh, are out there. They're easily found, and you can do something about them, and they're predominant in this country. Many of the diseases originate from the uh, vasculitis syndrome, and uh, triggering agents can be found and eliminated in most cases. In this series of 100 uh, is an example of it, and the key, obviously, is massive avoidance, neutralization, good nutrition, good oxygen, and immune modulation uh, for su successful treatment. Thank you.